Hi, this is Kevin Trainer, and I'd like to welcome you to my lecture on uh, Chapter 8 um, from the Kathy Schwabe book on Project Management. Uh, chapter 8 is called Project Quality Management. Um, before I, I start to cover the material from the chapter, uh, I'd like to share a little bit of my own personal perspective about uh, quality. And that is that I think that uh, I think that a lot of the intuitive stuff with regard to quality um, that we learn, you know, we've learned throughout our life, uh, is pretty good stuff. The stuff we're going to cover in the chapter is uh, maybe the non-intuitive stuff, right? Um, it's what uh, quality theorists and uh, quality scientists and all those uh, people have to offer that is going to really uh, supplement our own idea of what a quality job is. I think I learned... Uh, I think I learned about uh, quality um, from my parents. Um, I think I learned about uh, quality from the Boy Scouts. You know, we uh, when I was in the Boy Scouts, uh, we had a rule that says uh, we always leave a campsite uh, cleaner than we found it. Right? That was a great sort of quality statement and one that we always... Uh, uh, lived by. So um, uh, some of this uh, kind of folksy stuff with regard to quality about knowing what a good job is and being committed to doing it and all that kind of stuff, which I hope you subscribe to. Um, it may not get a lot of uh, play within the chapter, but that doesn't mean it's not important. Okay, it, it sort of underlies all this more formal stuff. And um, it's important too. Um, so, let's see. Slide two. Many people joke about the poor quality of IT products. Um, people seem to accept systems being down occasionally or needing to reboot their PCs. And... Um, uh, I have seen some funny jokes go by um, having to do with, uh, you know, the proposition, if we accepted the kind of quality that we expect from systems um, from other products, what, what kind of uh, humorous things would uh, result? But the fact is that uh, the kind of uh, quality that we expect from IT products uh, has really gone up a lot. Um, when I got into computing, uh, we did most of our commu computing on the mainframe uh, computer. And um, at our university, it used to crash at least once a day. And when I went to work in industry, our mainframe used to crash at least once a day, sometimes uh, two or three times. And uh, PCs now, you know, you can leave your PC on for uh, months at a time. Um, you can leave your smartphone on for months at a time. So, whereas um, we still probably have lower expectations from IT products than we have for, for some uh, 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 other products, our expectations uh, have gone way up, and they're probably going to get even higher. Uh, here on slide three, uh, this this is a side of quality that I think is uh, to be taken pretty seriously. Uh, in 1986, two hospital patients died after receiving receiving fatal doses of r radiation from a probably an x-ray machine uh, caused by a software problem. Um, well, 
in a world where we're increasingly using information technology as a component of everyday uh, products, um, the the potential cost of a quality problem is huge. I know that um, just in the past couple of months, there have been uh, reports um, of problems with this so-called autopilot software um, that is in the uh, Tesla uh, cars. Uh, I think there was a guy in Florida who was uh, uh, relying on the autopilot on an expressway and uh, was killed in an accident. There's a more recent uh, report of somebody on a windy road in Colorado uh, who was uh, relying on that feature and got into a pretty bad accident. I don't think they died. But to the extent that we are incorporating those kinds of uh, features into all kinds of uh, modern uh, devices, the potential for death, uh, serious injury, or uh, those kinds of things is certainly there. So, I mean, that, that means that we have a lot on the line. Um, let's see, there's a story here about a chemical bank mistakenly deducted about $15 million from 100,000 customer accounts. Hmm. Apparently mistaken. Um, and then we hear all the time about uh, data breaches, which are, are, are really uh, quality problems. So, um, the, what we really bring uh, within this uh, chapter, what we re really bring to the table about quality is a more rigorous way of thinking about it and talking about it, okay? So, um, sometimes if you talk to kind of everyday people about quality, um, they get it confused with uh, grade, okay? So, uh, for instance, they will say that um, they stayed at the Ritz-Carlton and they have a high quality carpet there. And they stayed at the, uh, at the Motel 6 and there was a low quality carpet there. But what they really mean is that these were a high grade and a low grade of carpet. And um, as we see on the slide here, um, the, you know, the more uh, technical definition for quality is the degree to which a, s a set of inherent characteristics fulfills requirements. So it's conformance to specifications. So it's entirely possible for Motel 6 to order a low-grade carpet um, and to specify its uh, characteristics pretty closely and to get a high quality fulfillment of that purchase even though it's not high grade. And uh, at the same time it would be possible for the Ritz-Carlton uh, to uh, specify a high grade of, of carpet um, and get a uh, a low conformance to, you know to spec perhaps it's uh it's a high grade but it's it's got some it's got some defects it's got some weaving defects it's got some pigment defects it has those kinds of things so we ought to really even though common everyday language will sometimes equate grade and quality that's not what we mean uh here what we mean is conformance to requirements or specifications. Um, and uh, the, uh, another aspect of this is uh, fitness for use. So a product can be used as it was 
intended. So even if it wasn't um, spelled out in the requirements or the specifications, uh, sort of implicit in um, the requirements for any product is that it, it be uh, fit for its intended uh, use. Okay, so now we, we've got a definition of, of quality and we're going to take a look at, um, typically as we do in the beginning of the chapters here, what are the processes that PMI identifies within this quality knowledge area as being part of quality management? So these include planning quality management, performing quality assurance, performing quality control. And how do they fit into these um, uh, process groups? Well, they're kind of spread out. Um, in the planning process group, we have plan quality management. In the executing process group, we have perform quality assurance. In the monitoring and controlling process group, we have perform quality control. So you're not going to be surprised at all that there is a planning component to quality because there's a planning component to every one of the knowledge areas. Okay. Um, but uh, so we are going to come up with some plans, right? And um, part of our plans have to include things like um, selecting proper materials, uh, preparing to train our people in uh, uh, quality standards for our project, um, planning a process that ensures the appropriate outcome. So we have to select the proper goals we have to train people to uh, pursue those goals appropriately. Um, and then we need a process that's going to make sure that we do achieve those goals. So in the IT area, which is uh, what we're primarily uh, focusing on within the text, uh, here are... Um, here are some scope aspects of IT projects. Okay, so we have the functionality of, of the system. We have the features of the system. We have its outputs. We have its performance, its reliability, and maintainability. So um, these are a kind of a sampling of what we call the requirements for a system. So probably the first three are what we call uh, functional requirements. And the last three are what we call non-functional requirements. And of course, um, it's the ability of the, the system that we either uh, create or we acquire during the project to meet these functional and non-functional requirements, which uh, determines how well we're doing on quality. So people like to talk about who's responsible for quality. Okay. Um, and you'll hear all kinds of answers to, to that. And uh, the different answers are all trying to make a somewhat different uh, point. So, for instance, uh, bullet one here, project managers are ultimately responsible for quality management on their projects. Kind of the buck stops here, right? So, um, whereas everybody has to be engaged with quality, who's going to make sure that it happens on the project? Well, the PM will. Um, Another thing that we're going to see later in the chapter is uh, a number of the quality theorists, theorists have said that it's really senior management who's responsible for quality. 
because in terms of the whole organization, that's where the buck stops. All right. Yet other times you'll see people say, we're all responsible for quality. And I, I think there's a point to be made there too. So um, who's right? Well, we're all right. Okay. I think that there's a, when you, when you make those kinds of statements, you're trying to underline some particular aspect of the responsibility chain for uh, quality. Okay, so let's talk about quality assurance. Quality assurance includes all the activities related to satisfying the relevant quality standards for a project. So you have to identify the quality standards that you're going to subscribe to, right? Uh, that's part of quality planning. And then quality assurance is uh, we're going to do whatever we're going to do to make sure, sure that we meet those quality standards. Uh, another goal of quality assurance is continuous quality improvement. Kaizen is a Japanese word for improvement or change for the better. So in some of the quality literature, um, a, a, a lot of really important work on uh, quality uh, has been done in Japan. Um, when when uh, uh, Japan was rebuilt after World War II, uh, the people who were involved in that enterprise um, were very friendly to uh, quality theorists and practitioners. And... Um, it became a friendly place for quality. And so uh, Japan got the jump, certainly on the U.S., in uh, modern approaches to quality. And we'll see that a couple times throughout the chapter. Um, we have a movement called Lean. So Lean involves evaluating a processes to maximize customer value while minimizing waste. So this is an approach to quality that's uh, uh, contemporary. Benchmarking generates ideas for quality improvements by comparing specific project practices or product characteristics to those of other projects or products within or outside the performing organization. So this is uh, pretty important stuff because um, it's really led to a common phrase that you hear a lot, best practices. People are saying that that, that, that uh, is a best uh, practice or we're in search of best uh, practices. This seeking best practices is um, the stuff of benchmarking. And a quality audit is a structured review of specific quality activities to help identify lessons learned that could improve performance on current or future projects. So quality audits are done during projects. They're done uh, sometimes at the end of projects. And what we're trying to do is... Uh, if what we're looking for is a continuous improvement, we want to see that, that that that's actually happening. And we'd like to see, are there areas where maybe we've lost our edge and we need to really tune things up? So quality audits are an important uh, part of the quality uh, processes. Uh, Kanban is a an agile methodology that um, is very popular right now and it um, it's both applicable to agile projects and um, it has a quality uh, kind of flavor to it. It includes a visual workflow, limiting the work in process, 
I just want to point out to you that limiting work in process is a way of reducing multitasking, right? Measure and manage the flow of the work. Make process policies explicit. Use models to recognize improvement opportunities. Okay, so one of the things that is interesting is that the Kanban is process oriented. And you'll see people applying it to continuing operations. Okay, but because our projects are full of processes, okay, this is a place where we can take uh, Kanban principles and bring them to bear on our projects. Okay, so we have to control quality. So in order to control quality, we have to have, uh, well, we have to have kind of a world view. And uh, the main outputs of quality control are acceptance decisions, rework and process adjustments. Uh, there are seven basic tools of quality that help in performing quality control. So quality control is really one of the first quality science practices that came, um, uh, came to prominence. Okay. And the idea of uh, quality control is that you want to look at your outputs. Okay. So if you're a manufacturer and you're manufacturing, say, rulers, well, you know, you measure the rulers that are coming off the end of the assembly line. If you are uh, doing some kind of a cataloging uh, project, uh, well, then you would, would inspect uh, uh, the catalog entries that come out of the cataloging process. Uh, so typically you're going to, uh, you have some kind of process that's throwing off these outputs. Okay. So, um, one is we have to decide whether we're going to accept the outputs. If we are going to accept the output, then we're done. If we're not, we typically are going to have to rework it. This is especially true of these uh, systems kinds of projects or intellectual work kinds of projects where, um, you know, the idea is we typically don't throw things away. Like somebody might uh, take a ruler that was too short and uh, sell it for scrap. Um, but we, we typically don't do that with intellectually oriented work. We, we see whether it can be fixed. That's rework. The other thing is process adjustments. So uh, I'm going to say now that what we want is we want processes that are under control. Okay. Now I'm going to say that here are some characteristics of processes that are under control. The outputs show minor variations. Okay. The variations are random and small, okay? Um, and uh, there's no way to find a pattern in them that means that you could adjust the process to make further improvements. So whenever we find variations in our output, that are uh, large or systematic or not random, then we, we, come, we become uh, convinced that we need to intervene and make these process adjustments. Okay, so we're going to be talking about these over the next uh, oh, handful of slides. So uh, here are some of the tools that people use um, to look at uh, problems or uh, quality issues. Um, one 
are these things called cause and effect uh, diagrams. They're sometimes called fish bones or Ishikawa diagrams. They were uh, introduced by a Japanese uh, quality theorist uh, with the name of Ishikawa. And uh, let's see, do we have a fishbone diagram? Yeah, we have one here on slide 14. So um, with a little imagination, you can kind of see that this looks like a fish. The head of the fish is on, on the right side where we see problem, etc. cetera. Uh, the bones of the fish are coming off that main kind of spine that you see. Um, and then uh, each of the major bones is a major contributing factor or uh, group of factors. And then coming off of those are uh, sort of the little fish bones. And they are contributors within that area. So essentially what we're trying to do is we're trying to either minimize problems or we're trying to maximize goodness. <laughs> okay. Um, and the, what we're looking for are the contributors. And this, it turns out to be a really nice way to um work with a group of people there's a template for this in visio and there are a lot of other uh diagrammers that have these kinds of templates but you can take a group of people you can work on a problem or opportunity you can analyze it like this and then you can go from here to some kind of action plan and what you're really looking for is you're looking for the root cause or root causes of your problems. So that's what you can do with a fishbone or Ishikawa diagram. Um, there's a technique called the five whys, which if I remember right, uh, is from a Japanese quality theorist named Toyota. Um, it's a technique where you repeatedly ask the question why uh, five levels of this is a rule of thumb. The, to peel away the layers of symptoms that can lead to a root cause. Now, um, both of these techniques are thoughtful ways to think about problems that are happening in the workplace or in our project. Um, if you're a project manager, people are going to come into your cubicle or your office and they're going to say the sky is falling. And, um, oh, such and such happened. It's the end of the world, blah, 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 blah. And it's very easy to get hooked into just really solving a symptom for them. And then they're back again. And then they bring their friends. And then they have another problem. So if we really want to understand problems, we need to go at them at a thoughtful way. And both the fishbone diagrams and the 5Y technique are ways to uh, kind of slow the process down, do it in a more thoughtful way, and try to get to the root causes of problems rather than, um, oh, solve some of the symptoms with, uh, with uh, Band-Aids. Quality control charts um, are pretty cool things, and they lead to this uh, kind of uh, numeric, uh, quantitative, uh, probably a better way to say it. They lead to a quantitative understanding of quality, um, kind of um, in the vein I talked about before. If a process is under control, the variations in the output are small, random, and um, are, are both small and random, okay? If we can see that they're not small, or if we can see that they're not random, 
then we ought to investigate whether some intervention will allow us to get more control over our process. So one way that we can um, diagnose this is to use uh, a control chart. It's a graphic display of data that illustrates the results of a process over time. The main use is to prevent defects rather than to detect or to reject them. Uh, okay. Uh, because what we're really trying to get at is managing the process underneath. Um, quality control charts allow you to determine whether a process is in control or out of control. We want it to be in control. When a process is in control, any variations in the results of the process are created by random events. Processes are in control, do not need to be adjusted. When a process is out of control, variations in the results of the process are caused by non-random events. You need to identify the causes of these non-random events and adjust the process to correct or eliminate them. Okay, so uh, to understand the seven run rule, you need to see a uh, quality control chart. Okay, so this is a quality control chart uh, for a manufacturing process for foot long rulers. Okay, and as you can see, we have right along the midline um, of the chart, we have a mean of 12.00. Okay, and what we're doing is we're taking the rulers to come off the assembly line and we're measuring them, perhaps with a big set of calipers or something like that. And then we're graphing the results. And again, if you think back to the theory that we're following, if we have a process that's under control, we would expect the variations to be small and random. As soon as they appear to be large or not random, then we want to uh, consider intervening and adjusting the process. All right, so these are the observations. Okay, so the mean is 12, so we have one, two above, then we go below, further below, up, down, up, down, down, okay, up, 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 okay. So statistically, when we're trying to judge the randomness of, of a uh, a set of observations, uh, we look for the seven run rule. So let's back up to that. The seven run rule states that if seven data points in a row are all below the mean, above the mean, or are all increasing or decreasing, then the process needs to be examined for non-random uh, problems, okay? Because what we would expect from a random process is we wouldn't get seven observations in a row that are all below the mean, above the mean, are all increasing, or all decreasing. Okay? So if we look at our uh, control chart, we can see that we've got here below the mean one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Boom. That is, that should be warning us that it's not random. And now over here uh, to the right of there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all decreasing. Okay, again, perhaps non random behavior. So we have two reasons why we might want to intervene here. We also have these things called a uh, control limit and a spec limit, okay? So um, we're expecting the rulers to be 12.00 inches long. The highest, the longest that we'll accept is 12.10 inches long. We set a control limit at 12.09 inches as soon as we cross over 12.09, we, we, 
you know, we ring the alarm that even if the variations are random, they're too large. So they're, they have to be small and random. And then on the bottom, we have a similar lower control limit and lower spec limit. Okay? So uh, that's how we do it. All right? So uh, in the kind of projects that we're likely to manage, okay, uh, IT projects, uh, cataloging projects, data projects, um, those kinds of things. Well, um, they're not rulers, okay? Uh, so we're going to have to think a little bit more creatively to see what kind of defects we would want to measure and how we would measure them, okay? But we can. And again, we ought to look for variations, okay? How far away from the goal are we? And is it, are the differences small and random? If they all are, then we're probably okay. If they get large or non-random, then we probably want to intervene and see if we can adjust our process. And this is as true for this more intellectually oriented work as it is for uh, this more physically oriented work that led to the chart on slide 17. Another tool that people use uh, for quality is a check sheet. It's used to collect and analyze uh, data, sometimes called a tally sheet or a checklist, depending on its format. Uh, we have a picture one in 8.4. So here uh, we're looking at system complaints. We're looking at their source. And we're looking at the day that they come in. And again, we would expect the number of complaints to be small and random. As soon as they get large, or as soon as they get systematic, then we want to see if there's a way that we can exploit that by making adjustments. Scatter diagrams are another tool that we can use because they show the relationship between two uh, variables. The closer two data points are, uh, the closer the data points are to a diagonal line, the more closely the two variables are related. So uh, here, um, we're looking at uh, the relationship between age of the respondent and user satisfaction. And we can see that there is a pattern. Okay. Now, um, is that a pattern that we can exploit? Right. Is this, uh, is this uh, something that we expect it to be true? Okay. We don't have lots of variation from that pattern, so uh, that looks okay. But there is a pattern, and um, perhaps it's one that we could exploit by, um, oh, let's see. Uh, it looks like the younger the age of the respondent, the higher the rating. So maybe we could increase advertising for uh, the older respondents, maybe we could increase uh, training, maybe we could change features. There's all kinds of things that we might want to do in order to act on this. We could look at histograms. So a histogram is a bar graph of a distribution of variables. Each bar represents an attribute or characteristics of a problem or situation. The height of the bar represents the frequency. So here we have a histogram showing the number of complaints by week. And again, if things are under control, we would expect the, you know, the differences to be uh, small and random. Okay. If they're 
constantly increasing or constantly decreasing, then we've got something systematic uh, going on. Now, if they're constantly decreasing, we probably have something good systematic uh, going on. If they're constantly increasing, uh, may, maybe something bad. If we see uh, a periodicity in them, if we see that every fourth or fifth week they spike, maybe we have some problems in our system with uh, uh, closing the end of a month or starting a new month. Now, <clears throat> we have an analysis uh, here called Pareto analysis. And it's based upon a chart called a Pareto chart. I just want to point out that I've heard, and I believe this to be true, that uh, Pareto, um, who was the, the theorist that they named this after, uh, says that this wasn't his idea. <laughs> okay. But by the time he made that claim, um, everybody was calling it Pareto charts and Pareto analysis. Um, it's essentially the 80-20 rule, meaning that 80% of the problems are often due to 20% of the causes, okay? If that's true, that creates an opportunity for maybe affordable or inexpensive or easy intervention. So here we have a sample Pareto chart, okay? And what we've done is we've taken the number of complaints this week, and we have created a histogram uh, with regard to causes, login, system lockups, etc. And so, and then we're uh, graphing the cumulative percentage um, represented by um, uh, the groups. So we see that about 50% are from just the first group, the login problems. When we add the system lockups, we're up to about 80%. Okay, so we've got two of one of uh, five, okay, um, which is 40% of the causes are um, accounting for 80% of the, the problems. Okay, so this isn't quite that 80-20 rule claim, but it's pretty good. It's not bad at all, okay? So the idea is, if you've got problems on your project, um, you've got to go about, uh, about uh, solving them in a thoughtful way, okay? Um, you've got to, if you're going to go intervene, here it looks like... Um, if we could address login problem and system locks up, we could make some really great headway here. And that's the takeaway, okay? Not that it was invented by uh, Pareto, because it either was or it wasn't. And not that it has to be 80-20, but that there is this uh, disproportionate um, uh, contribution of the highest uh, contributors um, within the overall population, and that creates opportunity for intervention. Uh, flow charts are uh, graphic displays of the logic and flow of processes that help you analyze how problems occur and how processes can be improved. They show activities, decision points, and the order of how information is processed. This is a classic kind of programmer's flowchart. In my systems analysis class, we teach some other kinds of uh, flowcharts like activity diagrams and uh, uh, data flow diagrams that are maybe more suited to understanding a workflow. But the idea is that you, you use some kind of a flowcharting language um, to uh, document the workflow. And then you look for, are there unnecessary parts? Are there 
confusing parts? Is there a way to streamline the process? There are all kinds of possibilities there. Um, so this brings us to run charts. So in addition to flow charts, run charts are also used for stratification, a technique that shows data from a variety of sources to see if a pattern emerges. A run chart displays the history and pattern of the variation in a process over time. You can use run charts to perform trend analysis and forecast future outcomes based upon historical results. Okay, so you can take really any time series data and a mathematical uh, analysis approach called linear regression, and you can you can analyze if there is in a a series of data points if there is a tendency of some kind of a straight line. Okay, and when I say a straight line, I don't mean that it it would be um, it wouldn't change on the y-axis, okay? Um, but it would be a straight line um, between uh, two points. And um, so for instance, when I, I look at the lines uh, here, the top line, uh, the top line seems to be fairly straight. If I were to draw a line between the beginning and the end there, I, I think I could come up with a straight line that kind of approximated that. Uh, the second line, well, maybe that's true as well, okay? I think you could come up with a straight line that you could use to predict that. Um, the third line, the gray one, seems to have a lot of variation. Uh, but perhaps you could fit there. So you can take uh, this kind of uh, stuff and uh, and use linear regression to look for uh, trends. Now, uh, here's a question that comes up. Um, it's pretty important, OK? Uh, not so important in your typical IT software development project as some maybe other kinds of projects that are of interest to our crowd, okay? Um, here's the question. Are you going to inspect every output that comes off the back end of your process? Okay. Um, are you going to measure every ruler that comes off the end of the assembly line? Or are you going to sample them? Okay, now in a typical software development project, um, we typically have to inspect the output in order to get somebody to sign off. So we're inspecting anyway. So we probably are going to, we're probably not going to look at a sample. We're probably going to look at the whole population. But um, let's say we were doing, uh, I had a great example of this. I had a student in this class who was uh, working at an academic library where they were um, barcoding all the items. And there were, I don't know, 4 million items, something like that. And they were doing it with student workers, okay? Uh, and so they were trying to come up with an approach to quality. And um, uh, we were talking about, you know, did they really want to handle every item uh, twice, once to, once to barcode it and once to, to inspect it? And that's, um, you know, that's 8 million operations, even if you count that as just two, right? So that was uh, too high. But we had this idea, what if you took a statistical sample um, and then um, and it, it, if you selected it properly, you could assume that you were getting a representative uh, sample. So this statistical sampling is something that we've been doing for years. 
in research. Uh, people do it in market research. Um, they do it in uh, more scholarly research. And uh, there's a formula that says if you want to have a fairly high confidence in whether, if, it, whether you, it, in fact, have a representative uh, sample, um, how many uh, how many units you have to uh, sample. So there's a sample size formula where the sample size equals 0.25 times the certainty factor over the acceptable error squared. Okay? And then we say consult a statistical expert um, if you're doing this. Now, there are statistical experts all over the place. And the fact is, if you think that you can use uh, sampling uh, to your benefit, then um, uh, it gets them out in figuring out how many you have to sample. Um, here's that certainty factor. So if you want a 95% certainty yeah, you know, the certainty factor is a lot higher than if you need an 80% uh, uh, certainty. Okay, that brings us to six sigma. Um, and six uh, sigma is a big deal. Um, and if you ask six uh, sigma people if it's a big deal, they'll tell you it's a very big deal. So six uh, sigma is a movement. So we say here on the slide, it's a comprehensive and flexible system for achieving sustainable, um, achieving, sustaining, and maxima, maximizing business success. Six the Sigma is uniquely driven by close understanding of customer needs, disciplined use of facts, data, statistical analysis, and diligent attention to managing, improving, and reinventing business processes. And we have a, a, a footnote there for that uh, quote. Now, um, Six Sigma is a movement. They certify people. Um, they, it's become kind of a mixture of quality science and quality religion. Um, if you're a practitioner, you can get certified. And they have a belt uh, system like uh, you would for the martial arts. Uh, they have a lot of really good ideas. And they're, they're dreadfully serious about these ideas. Okay? And you're, you're going to have to decide um, whether these ideas have something to add for you. So... Um, the the um, the Holy Grail, the place where we're, they're trying to get, and the origin of the name Six Sigma, is that they're looking for 3.4 defects per million opportunities. Well, that is really low. Okay, so the first thing you hear is that are they really talking about 3.4 defects per million units of output and the answer turns out to be no they're not okay they're looking at a process that that uh, creates a unit of output now this was very popular uh, this has been very popular at Motorola who invented the cell phone so um, how many operations or opportunities have to happen in the manufacturing of a cell phone? Well, certainly hundreds, potentially thousands, okay? So it's not 3.4 defective cell phones per million cell phones. It's somewhat less than that. It could be, um, it could be a factor of 100, it could be a factor of 1,000, uh, something like that. But it's still, um, even uh, 3.4 defects per 10,000 opportunities is still a very good 
uh, track record. Um, they have all kinds of stuff. They have a five-phase improvement process that they call DMAIC. And we have a slide on that. So let's see, the D is define, the M is measure, the A is analyze, I is improve, C is control. Now I've got to say, I love this acronym because it doesn't spell a real word. Whenever they spell a real word, I think they've manipulated the the acronym and they're manipulating me. Well, uh, Demaic is, <laughs> is not that. So they have some good thoughts here. Um, and uh, there's, there's a lot behind uh, what they're doing. Uh, how is their approach unique? Well, it requires an organization-wide commitment. They have training that follows this uh, belt system like the martial arts. Six Sigma organizations have the ability and willingness, willingness to adopt contrary objectives such as reducing errors and getting things done faster. It's an operating philosophy that is customer focused and strives to drive out waste, raise levels of quality, and improve financial performance at breakthrough levels. Now what is interesting here is that Six Sigma is a process improvement methodology. Okay, so how does it apply to projects? Well, projects are full of processes. So you could take Six Sigma and you could apply it to your project processes directly. Or conversely, Almost all projects that we do are trying to make some change in continuing operations. Okay. Um, every time we change continuing operations, we have an opportunity to improve their quality. So six Sigma principles could be driving um, the reason for our project and the requirements that we're trying to meet. Now, um, here's some comments about Six uh, Sigma, okay? And I'm trying to fit it into the greater quality picture. So uh, Duran, who was uh, a big player, uh, he stated that all improvement takes place project by project and in no other way. It's important to select projects carefully and apply higher quality quality where it makes sense. Companies that use six sigma do not always boost their stock values. Why? Because it's pervasive. Okay, they're not they're not trying to apply this on their most important project. They're trying to they're trying to well. Typically, they're trying to apply this in the way they clean the bathrooms, in the way they serve food in the cafeteria. When I say pervasive, I mean pervasive. Now, there are people who have been uh, critical of this pervasive, almost religious sort of approach to quality. And uh, Michael Harry says, I could engineer a a Six Sigma goat, but if a rodeo is the marketplace, people are still going to buy a Four Sigma horse. Aha. Now this is, I think, pretty insightful. Okay. Um, quality is only one part of the mix. Okay. If we're coming up with a mix to bring our goods or services to market, um, they need to have high quality, but they also, they need to do a good job of solving the needs of people in the marketplace. It's interesting that the company who was uh, really one of the founders of the Six uh, Sigma movement, Motorola, um, they were the inventor of cell phones. They not only invented the cell phone, they invented 
all of the apparatus that makes a cell phone go, uh, cell phones go. All the network equipment was stuff that they invented as well. Um, uh, do they make cell phones anymore? Uh, no. One could say that the cell phones that they were trying to sell were Six Sigma goats. And people decided that they wanted a Four Sigma horse. So um, Six uh, Sigma, I do think, has some interesting things to offer. But uh, you have to be able to fit their point of view into a wider perspective. Um, let's see, the training for Six Sigma includes many project management concepts, tools, and techniques. Again, it's a process improvement um, methodology, not particularly a project method, uh, management methodology. Uh, for example, Six Sigma projects often use business cases, project charters, schedule budgets, and so on. So again, a project that's doing things related to Six Sigma is a project. Uh, Six Sigma projects are done in teams. Project manager is often called the team leader. And the sponsor is called the champion. Well, that's uh, pretty consistent with the standard stuff that we're doing. Uh, in this class. Um, Six Sigma and statistic, here's a slide where we, we admit that we're not looking uh, at 3.4 million, uh, 3.4 defects for, uh, uh, per million units of output, but per million opportunities. And this, uh, uh, this works out to uh, uh, six standard deviations, uh, plus or minus uh, three standard deviations. Um, this kind of explains the math. Uh, Kathy Schwabe got into uh, kind of a shouting match with these guys. <laughs> uh years ago and in which uh i think she called them out for their statistics or at least she referred to people who did and they they got back to her in gangbusters and since then she's done a lot to explain their math um i'll leave the math to explain itself and as you can see the the three standard deviations on each side of the mean, which is what adds up to a total spread of six sigma. Uh, keep going. Some people talk about the six nines of quality. Okay, this isn't part of six uh, sigma, but this is another uh, measurement of quality. Uh, it's a standard measure of quality control equal to one fault in a million opportunities. In the telecommunications industry, it means that 99.9999% service availability or 30 seconds of downtime a year. Okay, so that, that's pretty low. This level of quality has also been stated as the target goal for a number of errors in uh, a communication circuit, system failures, or errors in lines of code. Uh, okay, so there are other uh, high standards for quality. Testing. So, uh, again, our text has, uh, has an IT focus, and a lot of the projects that we're going to be doing have some IT focus. Um, so, uh, approaches to IT projects, I think, um, have a special place in our heart, and testing is uh, one important approach. So, many IT professionals think of testing as the stage that comes near the end of an IT product uh, development. T testing should be done during almost every phase of the IT product development life cycle. 
So if we look at this um, chart, you can see that we're looking at the um, we're looking at the software development uh, process. And we're probably looking at it um, using a classic uh, kind of a deterministic kind of waterfall approach. And um, you can see that there's a gray portion around um, what we typically call, typically call uh, development unit design, code, and unit test. Um, even the people who are talking about, um, who, who are proponents of a more traditional sort of a waterfall approach to projects, believe that we ought to be testing things as early as we can. Now, this has led to a couple of ideas. One is this idea that when we're when we're creating these paper models of the system, things like um, number four in the diagram, detailed requirements, or uh, number seven, detailed uh, architecture, or eight, build operating environment, uh, nine, physical da database design. We can do some things to test all of those. Okay, okay, they're not all executable code, so we can't run an executable test, but we can walk through things. We can, we can, um, we can do some things to try to discover errors early. Uh, a related idea that's come from the IBM methodology called the Rational Unified Process is that they, they've really tried to marry the traditional waterfall approach to the agile approach. And they would take a lot of these things like the detailed architecture, the operating environment, the database design, and they would start to run experiments with those things very early on in the project. So they would, it's a way of, of sort of agilifying um, a, uh, a, uh, an otherwise waterfall kind of process. What kind of testing are there in uh, software projects where there's unit testing? where we test each individual component to ensure it's as defect-free as possible. Integration testing occurs between unit and system testing to uh, test groups of uh, programmable units. System testing tests the entire system as one entity. And user acceptance testing is an independent test performed by end users prior to accepting the delivered system. Now, uh, there, there has been a, um, there had been, there would be, <laughs> there's, there's a development in uh, testing over the years that has been kind of both good and bad. Um, People had this idea, well, we're going to professionalize uh, software testing. So we're going to have a quality assurance team. We're going to have a testing team. So we're going to have one team that's responsible for creating the product and another team that's responsible for testing and accepting the product. And that's had some followers. I mean, it's had some followers for 20 years. It's not a new idea. Um, and what really got those guys uh, thinking was this idea that, well, if you're a programmer and you want to believe that your product works, you know, you can't, without becoming sort of schizophrenic, you can't really uh, test the hell out of it. Uh, and so we ought to have an independent test team. Well, um, 
there's a backlash to that. So certainly the agile people would say that an independent test team is a bad idea. Um, and this guy, Watts S. Humphrey, is kind of saying a similar thing. He's a renowned expert on software quality. He defines a software defect as anything that must be changed before the delivery of the program. Testing does not sufficiently prevent software defects because the number of ways to test a complex system is huge. Huge users will continue to invent new ways to use the system that its developers never considered. He suggested people rethink the software development process to provide no potential defects when you enter system testing. Developers must be responsible for providing error-free code at each stage of testing. So this whole idea that as we go through the process, if people would maybe think, well, it's not my problem and we'll catch it later. Uh, that's not, you know, that doesn't work. And um, pretty much the agile people would would uh, agree with that. So there's, there's a movement afoot to, um, that is kind of counter to that kind of independent test team. The test team will catch it. We're not going to worry about it. There's uh, sort of this point of view that Humphrey represents that's more of a modern, uh, modern approach to testing, or uh, certainly contemporary um, now. Um, and probably the biggest uh, proponents of this kind of approach are the people who are part of Agile software development. Modern quality management. Modern quality management is a big deal. This is uh, modern in terms of the last, mm, well, certainly since the end of uh, World War II, okay? So um, we're going to, what we're going to talk now are, uh, we're going to talk about the quality theorists who uh, began their practice in Japan during Reconstruction, um, who weren't really listened to in the U.S. very much until uh, maybe the 1970s where, uh, um, Japan was just beating the pants off of the U.S. in terms of product uh, quality, and people said, "Hmm, let's uh, let's take a look at what the Japanese are doing." So that's the kind of the time frame in which a lot of these ideas um, developed, or um, developed, say, in Japan, and and then. Uh, uh, later, starting the 1970s, had a wider audience uh, here in the U.S. Uh, modern quality management, refer, uh, here are some characteristics. It requires customer satisfaction. It prefers prevention to inspection. It recognizes management responsibility for quality. Remember when I said who's responsible for quality? Well, here's the claim that management, senior management, particularly is responsible for quality. Noteworthy quality experts include Deming, Duran, Crosby, Ishikawa, Taguchi, and Feigenbaum. Okay. And we talk about all those in the textbook. So here are, here are some uh, uh, reports on, on what these uh, quality experts had to say. Deming was famous for his work in rebuilding uh, Japan and his 14 points for management. Joran wrote the quality control handbook and 10 steps to quality improvement. Crosby wrote quality is free and suggested that organizations strive for zero defects. Ishikawa developed the concept of quality circles and fishbone diagrams. Taguchi developed methods for optimizing the process of engineering experimentation. And Feigenbaum developed the concept of total quality control. Okay. Generally speaking, um, 
these guys came along and said, you know, this quality stuff is really important. It's not to be ignored. It's got to be committed to by senior management. And you got to get off your butt and get started doing this. Um, quality has become a big thing in the U.S. Starting the 1970s, people began to realize uh, that a lot of American products and services weren't competitive. Uh, a lot of people uh, got on the quality bandwagon. A lot of people, I mean, you really started to take it seriously, so seriously that in... 1987, um, they instituted the Malcolm Baldrige National Quality Award, which is given by the President of the United States to businesses. Three awards each year in different categories, manufacturing, service, small business, education, and healthcare. And these are uh, coveted. Um, uh, there has been a quality standard. The ISO uh, or, uh, organization is a, in, an international standards uh, body. And um, instead of having a separate quality standard around the world, the idea was to make a common cause and... Uh, come up with a common quality standard. So the ISO 9000 standard is a quality system standard that uh, is a three-part continuous cycle of planning, controlling, and documenting quality, provides the minimum requirements needed for an organization to meet its quality certification standards, helps organizations around the world reduce costs and improve customer satisfaction. There are quite a few procurements from the government uh, and sometimes some government contractors, and I mean uh, governments and contractors all over the world, that say that if you want to bid on some part of this work, you need to be ISO 9000 certified. Um, let's see, global issues. In 2015, 15 new electric cars were introduced throughout the world. Uh, world driverless cars are also being tested. Google's directors of self-driving cars is driving to improve their quality to reduce accident rates. So, um, I think this is really s significant, you know, from, a uh, from a systems quality point of view, from an information quality point of view, um, it, it, we're getting to the point where we're going to trust more lives to information and uh, information technology. And that, that has real life and death implications. So this is uh, pretty important stuff. Uh, what kind of things could we do in a traditional IT-related project to improve uh, project quality? Uh, we could establish leadership that promotes quality. We could understand the cost of quality. We could focus on organizational influence and workplace factors that affect uh, the quality. And we could follow maturity models. Now we're going to talk a little bit about uh, those. So let's talk about the leadership. Uh, Duran, he was one of these early pioneers uh, immediately after World War II. He said, it's most important that top management be quality minded. In the absence of sincere manifestation of interest at the top, little will happen below. A large percentage of quality problems are associated with management, not technical issues. And this is uh, this is kind of kind of interesting because uh, again, I I kind of came into the workforce in the 1970s when 
American companies uh, were really uh, taking it in the teeth from uh, um, certainly uh, Japanese uh, companies, but also uh, German companies, other European companies. Uh, uh, companies and, and there was a real concern about uh, the quality of our products and services and one of the things that people would say at that time is is uh, you know American goods are shoddy because American workers are lazy and uh, Duran uh, uh, he really said au contraire you know, American workers are going to pay attention to the people at the top. And if the people at the top are not quality minded, then the workers are not going to be quality minded. They're they're smart enough to follow the lead of the people who run the company. Um, and so quality has got to really start at the top. And I think the changes that we've made here in the U.S., uh, from say 1975 to 2015 which is what 40 years um i think they really reflect um a much greater interest in quality on the part of senior management and uh, workers have uh, followed you know workers uh, know where their bread's buttered um so i think uh, Duran was uh you know, was all over this about uh, where the real opportunity uh, was. The cost of quality is a big I I I I I I issue. People, people who didn't want to improve quality would say, well, we'd improve quality, but it's too expensive. Okay. And um, we're going to get to a claim in a minute here from uh, Crosby who claimed that quality is free. So he was, he didn't agree, right? So this kind of talk um, kicked off a lot of, of examination of what the cost of quality actually is. And the people, the quality practitioners say, well, the cost of quality is the cost of conformance plus the cost of nonconformance. So the people who were um, saying that quality is too expensive, well, they were looking at the cost of conformance. Um, that's uh, the cost of delivering products that, that meet the requirements and fitness for use. But they weren't really thinking about the cost of nonconformance, which is taking responsibility for the failures and not meeting quality expectations. And in a world where, um, say, American uh, companies were getting um, really beat badly by, say, the Japanese um, um, in industries like auto, um, this was a big issue because what was the cost of nonconformance? Well, it was a lot of unsold cars, you know. Uh, and now this can be true for uh, the software and information industries as well. A study reported that software bugs cost the U.S. economy $60 billion each year, and one-third of the bugs could be eliminated by an improved testing infrastructure. And I, I, this is kind of interesting because there is... Uh, um, I think we're probably not at the level, you know, the level of maturity that we have brought to manufacturing quality is, I think, greater than that we've brought to um, information technology, and especially software quality. So we have a lot of opportunity here. Here's some more uh, cost uh, categories, prevention costs cost of planning and executing a project so it's error free or with an acceptable error range appraisal cost the cost of evaluating processes and their outputs to ensure quality internal failure cost the cost incurred to correct and identify defect before the customer receives the product external failure cost cost that relates to all errors not detected and corrected before delivery to the customer. So this includes the cost of uh, lost customer goodwill. 
measurement and test equipment costs, the capital cost of equipment used to perform prevention and appraisal activities. Right? So did we get here to Crosby's quality is free? Nope, we didn't. So um, uh, Crosby, um, sorry, let me back up again. Uh, Crosby, uh, who's one of the popular uh, uh, quality theorists, um, he wrote a book called Quality is Free, and uh, he wrote, I think, two other books that uh, were follow-ups on that. And here's the here's the pitch that he made. And he was really making the pitch to senior management. And he was saying that the cost of uh, conformance is less than the cost of nonconformance. And that um, you had better get serious about quality because you're going to non-quality yourself right out of business. Because in a world where some organizations are serious about quality and other organizations are not, the organizations that are serious about quality are going to win and the ones that are not are going to lose. So, um, and so looked at it from a macro point of view, uh, Crosby said that quality is free because it's less expensive than the alternative. Um, this media snapshot is interesting for you to read, but not for me to talk about. Um, so organizational influence and workplace factors can influence uh, quality. Uh, again, um, what can senior management do to show that they're serious about the uh, quality? Okay. Um, well, there is some interesting stuff here. So a study by DeMarco and Lister showed organization issues had a much greater influence on program or productivity than the technical environment or programming languages. Um, program or productivity varied by a factor of one to 10 across organizations, but only 21% within the same organization. A study found no correlation between productivity and programming language, years of experience, or salary. A dedicated workspace and a quiet work environment were key factors to improving programmer productivity. Those are certainly things that are within senior management's uh, control. Expectations and cultural differences in quality. Um, project managers need to understand and manage stakeholder expectations. Um, expectations also vary by an organizations. The, the culture which can vary across uh, geographic regions. Um, I've lived in Chicago for uh, 40 years, more than 40 years, I think. Uh, no, not quite 40 years, but a long time. And before that, I lived in New Jersey and I worked in uh, New York. And, uh, you know, New York's a tough town. And um, I was always impressed at, at how uh, ragtag it was. You know, you'd go stay in a hotel in New York and you just look at the quality of the... Uh, you know, the tile work or the plumbing or, you know, whatever. And, and it, it just was, uh, it's pretty beat up by comparison to Chicago. So I, I, I've had this feeling, probably not very scientific, that um, different regions have different expectations about uh, what's a good job, what's an acceptable job, what gets by. And... Um, that's what led to my uh, uh, my observation about the quality of the plumbing and hotel rooms in New York uh, compared to Chicago. Um, now, quality maturity models are interesting things. Um, 
there are a lot of different maturity models. The idea is if we collectively think that there's some scale at which we ought to be improving um, software quality, um, uh, software engineering uh, capability, those kinds of things, um, what we can do is we can develop a model and then we can help organization assess themselves to figure out where they are on this kind of continuum of improving these things and uh, give them re recommendations about moving themselves to a more mature point on the scale. So two of these are the software quality function deployment model and the Software Engineering Institute's capability maturity model integration, which is called CMMI. Um, again, especially with this uh, CMMI um, uh, system, there are procurements where they want you to have been certified to a certain level of maturity um, on the CMMI system. So these things can become important for an organization from a sales and marketing perspective. A little bit more information on slide number 61 about CMMI. Uh, leave that for you to read. A PMI has a project management maturity uh, model that they've been uh, peddling since uh, 2003. It's the same kind of idea um, with respect to project management. Um, it has some degree of uptake. It certainly doesn't have the degree of uptake that CMMI has in uh, software engineering, but it's important to know about. Um, how can we use uh, software to assist us in the quality uh, side of things? Uh, spreadsheets and charting software could help us. Statistical software packages could help us. Um, if we're gonna if we're gonna adopt six uh, sigma, there are a lot of uh, software products in that uh, space. And project management software helps create Gantt charts and other tools to help to plan and track work that's related to quality management. So a lot of things we can do there. So uh, again, I just want to take a minute to say that we've covered a lot of formal and in some cases maybe even unintuitive things with regard to quality. And to the extent that you can use those and, and create value on your project, I highly recommend that you do. On the other hand, I think that this, this basic approach to quality, this kind of what's a good job around here point of view, uh, and whose responsibility is it for quality? These are really important things. And the fact is, it's everybody's responsibility. Now, if it's not important to people at the top, then it, 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 it'll be abandoned by people in the middle or people at the bottom. Okay, so it's important that people at the top of the organization be commended. It's important that the PM, who's sort of in the middle of the organization, be uh, committed. And it's important that the people who are on the team be committed as well. Because without this uh, sense of what's a good job around here and we're committed to doing it, we'll never get there. I mean, all the charts in the world will never get there. So, and this is stuff that's pretty much already within your, your understanding, your point of view, your usual practices. So there, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, to create value. I'm going to say bye until next time. Bye-bye.